Hi everyone, and welcome to the early, uh, the mid-career keynote for the Research Software Engineering Asia Australia Conference. I am delighted to introduce uh, Jess Ma, and I will read the uh, very official and very formal uh, introduction for Jess. Uh, Jess Ma is an associate professor at the Australian Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology. Uh, Jessica met, spent six months in the United Kingdom working for the European Bioinformatics Institute before heading to Harvard University in Boston to undertake her PhD. Later, she started her own lab at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, USA. She has won the Metcalf Prize in recognition of her leadership in stem cell research. Her research group focuses on the development of bioinformatics methods to understand how regulatory processes go awry in human diseases. The explosive ability of big data sets, coupled with the speed at which sequencing technologies have advanced, have created an exciting environment for the current state of computational biology research. The Ma group looks to modern tools and statistics, such as Bayesian methodologies and machine learning algorithms, to make sense of biology from big data. So that is the official introduction. The personal introduction is that I've known this <laughs> for a very long time. I have even uh, had to look at her code at some point in the past. <laughs> while I, was really, uh, I will tell you that story when we are not recording. And, uh, and that's just me, that's just the R part. It's not the your code. Your code is actually quite uh, good, to, easy to understand. And I'm really, really, really grateful for Jess to, to be here today. And I will hand over to her to start her talk. Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, everyone. Um, it, it is really wonderful to be here. And thank you for that really kind introduction, Roland. Um, it's been put to me that my official bio is, is a little bit stuffy, but but you made it very uh, approachable, I think. And uh, yes, Roland and I go back a, a long way. And so it's actually really quite meaningful and interesting to, to be here uh, giving the mid-career keynote, but more importantly, um, listen in on some of the discussions and topics that you're going to discuss in, in this conference. I think um, having met Roland early on in my career and having gone through different transitions uh, all in academia, I think we're at, I'm certainly at an interesting crossroads in, in thinking about how do we create more opportunities for people in this area with this sort of capability. Um, and also, you know, there are no easy answers. So I would love to hear your thoughts and, and questions and, and have a great discussion um, independent of, of just me talking. Um, so I'll leave a lot of space that that we can we can talk together. So um, hi, everyone. Um, I just also wanted to flag that I um, am coming to you from the Gold Coast uh, in, in Queensland. Um, and I, I'm actually running my own conference here at the moment, so it's not the most ideal setup. I'm, I'm in my hotel room and, and I hope the internet can sustain us. So let me know if there's any problems, though. Um, I gave uh, this the title of my talk just really because it overlaps a lot of with the kind of research that, that we do in my group. Um, so it's a bit of a statistical pun. Um, but I, I think also that there's a little non-normality in everybody. So I hope that... Uh, there are things that that you can take away, or I certainly have a lot to learn from all of you. So I just want to start by uh, shouting out some kudos to the research software engineer. Um, visibility is a, a really meaningful concept, and, and I think that's probably why, one of the reasons why we're all here today. Um, and funny story, uh, Roland approached me a, a while ago, and he said, I'm, I'm putting together this conference and, and would you be interested in giving you this talk? And I had a look at the conference spiel um, and it, 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 this is, this is, it, Roland did not pay me to say this, but I actually had no idea what a research software engineer was. And in reading the paragraph and I thought it was so well written and I'm sure Roland or Paula, you guys put that together, but it is, I think, such a wonderful delineation of the kind of people that I've worked with um, and also as someone who I, I think I've become um, as in working in bioinformatics. Um, and, and I think this part you've all captured really well is this trouble of defining their role and value within academia. Um, and academia is, is a very 
well-defined hierarchical space. Um, and, and I sort of see over the years uh, people who would subscribe to this label of being a research software engineer, sometimes getting lost and sometimes not getting the kind of promotability or visibility that um, is is congruent with the skill sets and the contributions that they bring. So I think this is a fantastic idea to get people together to, to talk about some of these issues. Um, I'm a big believer in you can't be what you can't see. And, and I think in reading this paragraph, my jaw just completely dropped open and I, I felt really seen. Um, you know, and, and I hope many of you feel this way, that this conference has given you um, a platform where, where you feel seen and, and recognized too, because I think that's a really important step um, to doing the great work that we we do. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about, I'm, I'm not sure, again, I'm, I'm not in my office, so I don't have my dual screens. Is the Zoom panel blocking the top of the slide? No, I don't fine. know if what fine, it's fine. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cause I don't know if what I see is what you see, but anyway, um, it's actually blocking it for me. So I'm going to move it a bit. Okay. Um, so just, just to highlight as, as Rolla mentioned, um, I am a research academic at the university of Queensland. Um, I run a research group that largely does bioinformatics research. Um, I'm guessing I, I saw in the chat that there's some fellow bioinformaticians out there and I, I certainly recognize some names and, and faces there. So it's, it's really great to see you. For those of you who aren't aware, um, bioinformatics is a discipline that combines statistics and computer programming with the goal to really solve complex questions in biology. Um, and one of the other things that I think bioinformatics makes bioinformatics such a, an attractive capability is that you learn to work with big data sets. Um, and I know data science in the last few years has become a, a very strong buzzword. Um, and it can mean a lot of different things to different groups of people. Um, but certainly I think the, the real thinking and engagement with the messiness of big data and trying to use statistics, but also using programming because the data is so large to arrive at actionable conclusions um, that we can move forward in science. I think that's really capturing what we do in bioinformatics. Um, so in, in my career, I've been uh, working in research for, for quite a while now, um, but the kind of contributions I've made have been in, in different areas of biology. So stem cells, aging, cancer, and neurological diseases. Um, as Roland alluded to, I used to love coding. So I, I started my career as a undergraduate in statistics and mathematics. Um, and I used to really love the, the fact that you could just write lots and lots of our code and, and get insights into data uh, in ways that other people really, really couldn't. Um, but having said that, I am a group leader. I'm an associate professor at a university um, and I'm based at a research institute. So full disclosure, I have a fixed term contract in three years time. I'm going to be looking for another job. Um, and so what that really means is that I now love mentoring people who love coding. And, and sadly, the amount of code that I write these days is, is very small and for embarrassing applications like exam questions and, and not for research. Um, but that's okay. I mean, I, I really love working with the people that that work in my group. It's It's been really exciting and, and challenging, but also stimulating to, to, to try to help them and, and get them set up in their careers. And I think some of the, the points that uh, were alluded to in the discussion about creating sustainable jobs, um, I think is a really, really important one and, and one that I think we need a lot of input and, and action on quickly. Um, so uh, just to, to go back to some of the work that I do, um, the title of my talk is, is really inspired by the kind of research that fundamentally my, my research group has been focusing on for the last 10 years. Um, and it's essentially stepping back from this question of assuming things follow a certain way. Um, for those of you who know data will know that that takes about five seconds before we throw that assumption out the window. Um, but really, um, eff effectively made a career out of asking what's what's not normal? You know, what if it's not normal? And by that, I'm, I'm talking about the statistical distribution, the normal distribution. Um, and so just to remind you, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this bell, bell curved shape. Um, but in statistics, there are actually other kinds of distributions that we don't often talk about, but these have similar 
uh, have the same sorts of mathematical kinds of definitions and statistical properties that we all know and love the normal distribution to have. Um, but as you can see by the diversity of shapes, there's different ways to model data and there's different things we can get out of these distributions. Some are really easy, like these bimodal distributions where we can get uh, different sorts of um, different sorts of subclusterings. Um, others like the log normal and the, the Pareto are really good for modeling asymmetric data. So um, in bioinformatics, um, all the way back in 2011, um, this was really the first paper that uh, set my group apart and, and ahead. And this is the idea of instead of looking at the average expression, which is what most people do when they look at gene expression data, is to think about using the variance. So while variance is a property of the distribution, it means instead of looking at the center location, we're now looking at the width of a distribution and proposing using this as a regulatory parameter to understand how diseases work. Um, and this was a, a proof of principle uh, kind of question uh, working with actually some of Roland's former colleagues. And um, we found some really interesting things. And, and from then on, we started to look at this question more closely. What happens when we don't ass assume a normal distribution of the data? And I've had various students who have taken this idea further um, I had a wonderful MD-PhD student, Dr. Daniel PK, who um, was looking at bimodal gene expression in, in breast cancer patients and found some really interesting um, subgroupings there that helped us identify some new regulators. Um, I've got a current student, Melindri Dalmaratni, who's about to finish her PhD, and she's been looking at the prevalence of different sorts of shapes and single cell RNA sequencing data, and also what that means. Um, this is also quite a big departure. We don't tend to think about modeling gene by gene individual distributions, and she's finding some interesting things that really challenge the assumptions that we all make. Um, I've been working with a, a wonderful student, Ebony Watson, um, who's just had a paper published in Briefings in Bioinformatics, where we're trying to understand what does distance really mean in, in the context of these high dimensional maps where we're trying to reduce down data that has you know, tens of thousands of axes. Um, and what can we learn from that? Because again, there's lots of assumptions there at play and we're finding that depending on the data structure, there are different conclusions that we can make. Um, but I'm really here to talk more about how do we empower research software engineering communities. And so I thought it might be insightful to share some of my origin story um, in terms of how I came down this path. Um, I wanted to start out this part by saying that I, I really slept my way through a first year undergraduate engineering math course. Um, and that was because we we were taught as probably many of you were, um, or maybe nowadays they do it really differently, but um, learning Maple and, and MATLAB. And so these really, you know, mini tutorials on, on how to learn how to code for the first time. And I say I slept my way through because at the end of this, I did not know how to code. I didn't even know I didn't know how to code. Yeah, and it wasn't until I went to WeHi uh, in Melbourne in 2000, and I was fortunate to get this summer internship working with Jean Yang. And I, I can't remember exactly the project, but she effectively gave me like a set of box plots and said, you know, I've got this software in R that does this sort of analysis, but I've got these box plots and I, I need you to basically flag when there's like dots, like outliers in the box plot or um, where they are, how far they go or something like that. And it was super, 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 super simple question. Like you could see the dots and it took me a few weeks to learn R, to get it to do what I needed to do, to get it to do it correctly um, and then complete that loop in a, a timely way. And I remember those few weeks were the most exciting, you know, weeks of my career, at least at that stage. Um, and it, it really kind of reflected how in insignificant or un, unsubstantial, I suppose just that's the right word, um, the undergraduate training had been. Um, and it was a real contrast to actually have the chance to sit down, focus on a, a specific problem with coding and orientate my learning around that. And so after that, I, I really caught the research bug in, in a really big way. So I went on to ANU for the following summer and worked with Professor Sue Wilson there. 
And it's it's all, also this um, idea of being lucky and, and also being open and available for opportunities. Um, so while working at ANU, they had struck up a collaboration with a startup company, Bilateral in Sydney. And so these guys were basically doing the first um, set of bioinformatic courses uh, around the idea of learning how to analyze at the time microarray data. And so uh, they invited me to come along with their, their teaching team. And so for a year, um, I was really fortunate to be able to uh, teach courses around Australia, so effectively on how to use R to do basic statistical analysis of micro R and microarray data. Um, and that was both a really exciting way to uh, engage with researchers and understand the kind of problems that they wanted to solve. Um, but for also for me, who was really, I was still an undergraduate then, um, it was a really a formative sort of experience in learning how to teach. Um, and at the time, um, I, I remember one of my colleagues who was part of Bilateral, who I was co-teaching with, and, you know, I was quite nervous and insecure being, you know, an undergraduate uh, lecturing in these courses when we had participants who were professors and group leaders um, elsewhere. And he said, you know, you really just need to know the right amount to teach something. Um, if you know too little, obviously that's not going to work. But actually, if you know too much, sometimes that that doesn't mean you're going to be a better teacher. And I think that was a really important message that I've carried through my career, um, that you just knowing stuff doesn't make you a good teacher and that there's other ways that are actually really important to pay attention to to get that information across. Um, after that, I, I went for six months, as Roland mentioned in the intro, to EBI in Cambridge, England. Um, and I worked with Albus Brasmuth there working on some software. Um, I then went to Harvard to, to do my PhD. And I, I went there specifically to go work with Robert Gentleman, who I'm not sure if people are familiar with who he is, uh, but he is the co-creator, inventor of R. Um, and it was my dream to, to work with him. And um, being at Harvard also meant I could do some other things. So I, I taught our courses at the Harvard School of Public Health and also at Cold Spring Harbor in, in New York, where if you know genomics is basically the mecca of molecular biology and, and genetics and genomics. So that was a, a really fun sort of experience. Um, along the way, as, as many dreams sort of don't come true, Robert actually left to, to move to Seattle. Um, but in the process, I was able to transition my PhD to John Quackenbush, who is also um, a huge person in, in terms of software development as well, um, and ultimately then finished my PhD in 2008. So I, I think, well, obviously, there's a whole other chapter that went on afterwards. I think for me, sort of developing the kind of skills that that I needed and, and the sort of mindset to do the research I do, I think all of this here is, is really what sort of was very formative. Um, and I think for everything that I've learned, um, sorry to keep moving this around, I hope it doesn't annoy you. Um, for everything I've learned, I, I think the conclusion, the one conclusion I can stick to is that science needs everybody. Um, and along the way, one thing that um, I've really enjoyed doing is to to run hackathons. Um, and I think they're really inclusive kind of environments that bring out a lot of the fun um, and creativity that is inherent in, in the kind of software engineering research that we do. Um, and so I, I ran a stem cell hackathon uh, at UQ a few years ago before the pandemic. Um, and that was really focused on trying to get more people, especially people who for whatever reasons may have shied away from programming to get them involved. And, and we use stem cell research as an anchor to get people kind of focused on a specific scientific topic. But the real goal was to break down barriers to data science capabilities, um, to try to, you know, break down that sort of phobia people might have about programming and just develop that approachability, accessibility so that uh, people could see that it is actually a lot of fun to learn how to program, to use programming when you've got a really central, important question to solve and a team around you. Um, so I think that was that was really, really great. Um, before that, uh, when I was still based at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, we also ran a, a hackathon there, but that was based more around aging. And again, it, it was themed around getting more people to to have a go at programming, to come along, to work with, with different kinds of disciplines of, of research. 
Um, and that also was a, a huge success. So um, I, I, do, I haven't run a hackathon since, but I, I would definitely be open to it. I, I know it's become a much more popular medium um, since we I first tried in, in 2017. And so um, it's really great to see that becoming more popular, especially in our community. Um, Oops, sorry, that, there we go. So I, I think also another thing I've been involved in is um, trying to see at what age we can foster sort of this critical thinking and, and data science mentality. Um, and a, a few years ago, I, I did a pilot experiment at the AIBN where I basically uh, sat one-on-one -on -one with kids to, to see if I could either get their curiosity up around data, um, see what they thought about data science related questions and also get them to try out some preliminary skills in, in data science, whether it was making plots or writing codes or um, coming up with other ways to engage with data. And as you can see with all the, the pictures here, it was a really great success. Um, so I'm in the process of trying to expand that out to a high school program. Um, I guess the slide's a little bit old because we weren't actually able to debut something in 21, we did get funding actually to, to take this uh, to the next level, but because of COVID, we weren't able to take it out to schools and the funding program weren't happy with that. So we weren't able to move forward, unfortunately. But I think maybe there's a possibility now that things are, are starting to come back. Um, so I, I think that research, you know, regardless of the kind of specifics and the technicalities of the research you do, for me in my career, um, research has been a really wonderful outlet for curiosity. Um, and so it's really not just about the results that you generate or the papers you write or the software programs that you output. Um, for me, and, and I think for everyone, like it, it's a really powerful kind of learning experience. And it it's really built, you know, that sort of personal growth. Um, it gives you networks that move your career forward, whether it's intentional or serendipitous. Um, and it also develops or really challenges you to, to grow your own self-awareness. Um, academia is a tough environment. And I think understanding yourself, understanding the limitations and strengths you bring um, are really one way to, to keep moving forward. Um, and I think regardless of what career path you go down, whatever job title you end up with, I think developing this, this outlet for curiosity, developing these sorts of properties that you have, um, I think are really important. So um, I put this together actually for undergraduates a while ago, and I thought it was a kind of a cool bingo card to, to keep track of. You know, I sometimes in the busy day-to-day -day lose sight of some of these questions, but I think it's important to keep them close, um, you know, just to keep checking in with, with yourself and, and understanding, you know, what keeps you up at night, what do you really enjoy the most? I think as we get older, as as we've become more grown up, you know, we send, tend to lose sight of these things that are fun or enjoyable or inspiring. Um, you know, so I think there's value in just making note of what stories resonate you. You know, who do you talk to that you're really intrigued by? Is there a gap or a disconnect that you really, really, really want to learn more about um, and using those sorts of questions to guide where you're going internally. Um, I think there's always value in that. So I think the other thing that it would be irresponsible to, to acknowledge is that, as I said, academic academia is a tough environment and because of that researchers need to be resilient. Um, Roland was talking about triggers earlier and, and I think there's you know, not enough acknowledgement of that or not enough conversation perhaps around that. Um, but nevertheless, you know, there there is a lot of uh, kind of resilient people walking around. Um, but I, I highlight that not, not because I, I really want to harp on that, but the fact is we often don't talk about the fact that researchers need a lot of other skills, I think, to make science go smoothly. Um, and so we think about, you know, research being built on very precise set of skills and programming is certainly one thing. There's no wiggle room around, you know, calling a function or, or working with, with a, a data variable. But I think sometimes we lose sight of, especially in our training of others, is that things like compassion, patience, you know, effective communication, respecting others, being empathetic and understanding that, you know, people may be on a different path. Um, I think if we could bring more of that into our research front and center, I think in many ways, some things would improve. Um, and to me, I've, I've got two models that I really like to sort of lean on 
in, in various times of my career. And they both come from um, a remarkable artist, uh, Marie Andrews, uh, Andrew. Uh, so you can find her on Instagram um, and she's got various books and things like that. But, you know, and, and I'm sure you've seen sort of variations of this in, in some sort of capacity, but this idea that, you know, what you see is the tip of the iceberg, what you see shared in, being shared on Twitter or, you know, uh, for people that are doing well, it's it's really great, right? And, and we certainly celebrate and applaud those efforts. But behind that, there's all these different things. Yeah, and you never know for certain people, how deep this iceberg goes, right? Or what parts of that iceberg are really cutting into someone's life. And I think it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah. Um, and that certainly, you know, affects how effective we are at work. Um, this other idea of resilience, you know, and, and developing strength and, and self-awareness and all that sort of superpower that we, we call upon, um, especially to be leaders. You know, I, I heard there was talk more about, how to empower senior RSCs. And, and I think as we move up in, in the career ladder, you know, we do take on bigger fights. Um, and I think we often focus on sometimes so much on, on the negativity of those fights without stopping to celebrate how far we've come um, and the kind of fights we've we've actually been successful in, in navigating. So um, let's see. I know that uh, time-wise we're sort of running short and I don't want to you know, slow down the time too much. But um, I think if anything, we can sort of talk together about how do we support our RSCs. And, and I think that's what the afternoon sessions are also for. And I apologize, I, I can't be a part of that because of the conference here. But um, it sounds like you're all set up to have a really great discussion. But some of the things that I've been thinking about is, you know, academia is a bit like being on a roller coaster and in some ways the chaos is, is a bit like being at an amusement park um and so not not to get too deep about it um but you know some of the questions that have, I've been wrestling with lately is are we in an environment that supports and values problem solving you know I think the kind of work that we do is 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 so important for developing solutions but sometimes that's not the same thing right um in terms of what's valued in our day-to-day -day jobs. Um, obviously, what is the future of academic positions, specifically research positions in a university framework? Um, how do we celebrate achievements? You know, I think with other industries that are more established, there are certainly, you know, more prestigious kinds of traditions that people follow that allow us to celebrate quite naturally, you know, achievements from our colleagues. Um, but, you know, when you're a new industry, it's it can be hard, right? And I know Roland's trying to create different prizes and, and things like that. And I think that's also really important, both for celebration, but also visibility. Um, one thing I wrestle with a lot is how do we develop critical thinking skills, especially with different generations who have different sorts of training sets and, and, and um, kind of ways to think about the problem. And I think they're all valuable, but how do we sort of corral that to, to develop, you know, excellence in, in critical thinking? How do we build identity and credibility as a group? I feel like the attention span for so many things, I mean, we saw that with data science, um, it can be difficult, I think, to engage and define and control. Um, and for grant writing um, as a research academic, this is my, you know, greatest bugbear and, and how do we navigate those cycles? I, for those of you who have been grant writing in Australia for the last two years, you also understand that the road has been exceptionally bumpy and um, it's hard for us, but it's also hard for our ECRs. You know, I saw that the ARC just opened their DECRA call for next year, but my understanding is the existing call has not even been announced. Like the those people have have not heard the the outcomes, so I think that's hard. Like, how do we mentor our ECRs to to do these sorts of things when so much is at stake, like contracts, um, research, um, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, so there's a sustainability issue. Grants in, in Australia are really only three years, uh, five years for fellowships. And when we think about the that with the cycle of a PhD student, right, um, it's just really hard to create, you know, critical mass with, with those kinds of timelines. Um, and there's also an equity issue from lots of different dimensions. How do we write, make this grant writing experience, you know, one that is more aligned, I think, supporting our RSCs. 
And I think a big topic is reproducibility and research. Um, and this last one here is how to foster mentorship. You know, other, other disciplines have sort of got different programs and different um, streams of, of developing a mentoring kind of community. And I think, you know, all those have pros and cons. And, and I think it's interesting to talk through, you know, the limitations and the successes that we can sort of mimic um, I wanted to end uh, with this sort of last, I, I know that slide was a bit negative, um, but I wanted to end with this slide. So as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, while this term of research software engineering is is quite new to me, I feel like, you know, it's it's something that I've been entrenched in for, for my career. And it struck me. So um, recently I, I've been mentoring different kinds of students, supervising different students. And I have a, a medical student who who wanted to do a research project and he actually had worked at a software engineering company for, for quite some time. And it's really interesting because he is asking lots of great questions, you know, about some of the research that we're doing. And a lot of it's based on, you know, but we don't have that. We don't have the standardization and we don't have this framework that's version controlled or we don't have this. And it, it's really interesting because well, those are really important points. You know, I've got another student who's an undergrad CS major and he comes in and he says, well, you know, we don't have version control, but maybe we could do it this way. Or we we don't have this, but, you know, maybe we could, you know, check this one and that one. And he's just brimming with ideas, you know, and how do we navigate these kinds of problems? And I think to me, that sort of seems like the value that fostering this kind of community brings because, you have to demonstrate out of the box thinking and be creative with the solutions that that you um, you put forward because in a research software engineering environment it's different from a, a formal or I don't know what the other word is a a commercial software engineering environment where you know there are much clearer sort of safeguards or, or things that are put in place and I think that's really great because I see people getting really paralyzed right and and not being able to to know what to do. Um, and I think having that kind of research mindset means that you see those lack of safeguards and you see the, the goalposts and, and you figure out a way to get there. And so one thing I've also seen, which is, I think, really commendable is this commitment to building new research infrastructure, right? That, you know, we need to get to, to point X, but if it means we have to build a boat and, and the oar to get us there, then, then we'll do it, right? Um, and it takes a certain special individual, I think, to to see that and, and also be willing to do that, yeah. Um, and obviously there's a, a sense of fearlessness that, that comes, you know, when everything is not completely defined um, because I think a lot of people do get scared when they see that, you know, it's like, well, what are the variables? How do we not know, you know, this and this and this? But when you think about it, you know, life research is, is com incompletely defined, right? You're never going to be in a situation where everything is locked down and documented and, you know, controlled and tested. So actually it's much more realistic, I think, to be in this, in, in this type of setup where you have to solve these kinds of problems. Um, and I think over the years, working with different kinds of research software engineering people, um, they've taught me, taught me a lot of things about, you know, the importance of reproducibility and everything else that has to come around that. But this uh, commitment to standardization, you know, I worked with some of the people who did all of that early foundational work in bioinformatics with setting up the microarray um, gene expression data standards, uh, right? And this idea also of accessibility, you know, we, we live in a time now where open access is almost a given. Um, but I still remember, you know, lots of journals locked behind paywalls and, and things like that. And so data not being shareable and, and things like that. So I, I think it's really important to, to not lose sight of that. Um, and also longevity, you know, how do we create resources that will stand the test of time, will be there for other people when you know, our jobs are not there or we have moved on to other things. Um, and I think the thing that I've seen the most in my career and watching other people as well is that it is a training that requires a sort of style of apprenticeship, right? So we mentor people, we bring them under our wing, we give them projects to, to work on um, where they hone their own skills. And I think that very naturally lends itself to this idea of mentorship 
Um, but then how do we take that on a bigger scale um, and build a really robust, supportive community? So with that, I'm going to end uh, my talk and sorry for going a bit over, but um, I have to acknowledge a lot of people in my career. Um, I lived in the US for 16 years and through that process had lots of really people, really wonderful people that I worked with. Um, while being in Australia for the last six years, I've also been really fortunate to have some really amazing researchers uh, to, to work with and um, also am hopefully uh, able to, to hear from you and any thoughts or ideas or questions you might be having, more than happy to uh, to answer them and address them. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jess. That was a really great.